Abby, it's such a pleasure to sit down with you and talk. Tell us a little about who you are and, and your sailing experience. All right. Um, so I'm Abby Brown. I, um, I grew up sailing on the west coast of uh, Canada, so all around Vancouver Island, a little bit in Vancouver. My parents both sail, so I was kind of forced into it, and I hated it at first. Um, like I, my parents would drop me off at Learn to Sail in the summer, and I was not a fan. Um, but I just like I kept at it, and I I got better and I got better, and I started on a race team, and I am very competitive. So the fact that I was able to turn something that like my family did all the time into something that like I could compete in was awesome. Was so. there a moment in that, because that's a common story. I, I grew up next to a family where one of the children, one of the people uh, went on to the Rio Olympics. But I remember the days when it was like, I have to practice again. Nobody else is having <laughs> to practice. Was there a transitional moment where you went from, boy, this is a drag to, oh, wow. And what were the things that you experienced that caused you to flip? The um, a lot of it was who I was sailing with and my coach. So my first couple of coaches were just summer sailing coaches, and it felt a lot like they were doing it for a job as opposed to doing it because they loved it. And I could see that they loved it, but they loved sailing. They didn't necessarily love coaching. And then I, at that same club, we had some turnover, and I got some awesome coaches. And they really, they made it fun. And they made you, they made you want to show up. And I still didn't necessarily want to go out on the water, but I wanted to be there. And that was the first step, just like getting me to the yacht club. And then they started bringing me out on their keel boats. One of them had a J24 and then later on bought an Olsen 30. So we did a lot of just like keel boat sailing on the weekends and that kind of thing. And they really just like got me into it and showed me like the fun side of it as opposed to just, like, my parents dropped me off here and now I'm stuck here for the day kind of thing. And that really hooked me. And then I went on to a race team in Nanaimo. And our coach there had a lot of faith. Um, And it was a small club. We had maybe three or four 420s going at a time. And so it was a very, like, tight-knit community. I still keep in contact with all those guys some of them are off doing 49er campaigns now and one of them's down in Antigua and like we all we all did amazing and I think it's because we were such a small team and we all bonded really closely and again we had a coach that really drove us and then I moved out to Victoria and same kind of thing I had a great coach Steve McBride he's he's done everything um and again he just had so much faith um he is coaching at a Royal Victoria Yacht Club and he's done, he's done a lot. He brought our um, Paralympic team down to Rio um, in whenever that one was, 2016. 16? Yeah. But, yeah, so he's, he's an awesome coach and same kind of thing. He just, like, he had the faith and he showed me how it can be fun and where I could go with it. And it just kind of opened a bunch of doors from there. And now... I'm out in Ontario, I'm going to university, and I'm coaching, like, the very, like, junior race teams and, like, getting them at that same kind of moment. Like, I want them to be excited to go sailing. I don't want them to feel like it's work yet. And, like, eventually, if they get good, like, it will feel like work. I've, I've definitely had those moments, too, but just, like, making it fun first, and then they want to do it, and even if it there aren't fun moments they know that the fun is coming um and that was a big part of it just so do you like to drive do you like to be in the front um I have spent a lot more time in the front so I'm definitely more confident um not driving um that being said I have a match racing regatta in Vancouver starting on Thursday and I'm driving for that one so um I can do it but um I definitely like being in the front I like being able to like trim sails and have like different roles and I find that if you're and there's nothing against this but like if you're a good driver you often end up driving boats and if you're a good crew you kind of get to move around a lot more and there's a lot more opportunities because a lot of the time the driver is the owner and I don't own a boat I have (laughs) I probably won't for a very long time but um I just found that it opened a lot more doors to be a crew but I, I do love driving the boats, well, too. Well, the jib and the shoot are 
incredibly important. They, yeah. they can, you know, they make a huge difference. And so really you're in control a lot up front. So can you tell us a little bit about how you manage that? How, how do you think about uh, setting the jib and how do you think about setting the spinnaker? And what are some of the things, uh, you know, we've had a, an experience in the last weekend where you helped my crew think through some things with uh, setting the chute downwind. Um, can you kind of walk through your thoughts about how you lead the foredeck, the front? Um, a lot of it for me is about the feel. Um, I've been sailing for a while, so I know what it's supposed to feel like. And I just play with it to get it where it's supposed to be. And it does take a while for you to get to, like, figure out what it feels like. So my, like, to get there, I would say go out with someone that already knows what it's supposed to feel like, get them to set it up, and then you get to feel it. So that's the first kind of step, like, for my kids, I will rig up their boat, I will tune up their boat, and they go out, and they know what it feels like to feel, like, how it's supposed to feel, and then I tune it up wrong. So they know what it feels like when it's wrong. And they kind of get that feel in the boat of this is how it should feel in this wind, and this is how it shouldn't feel. So it's a lot of feeling, and within that, and then I make them do it. And I don't tell them what to do, I'm just like, okay, like, go play with your vein today. We are cleaning the main sheet, sail with your vang and just like getting them to feel the boat and feel what feels right what doesn't feel right like this feels fast going upwind but really slow going downwind and that kind of thing so it's a lot of just like I want them to be able to close their eyes and just like feel how the boat is moving or look at the sail and see how the sail looks and be like this isn't right I need to change it or this is right it feels good if you were, because a lot of it is probably just feel, it's intuition at this point, but if you had to force yourself to try to put words around what you're feeling, um, what would you tr- how would you describe right versus wrong? So I would feel, I, so on the upwinds, um, a lot of it, and we experienced this on Friday, was um, we were sailing upwind and we didn't have power through the waves. And my skipper was driving through the waves amazing but we just didn't have the power to get through them all the way um and you can kind of see it on your boat and if you have like a speed puck or a Vaccaro's atlas like anything that's telling you how your speed is going you can you can see it it's going to drop every wave or like every puff or every lull like it's not going to stay consistent um so that's a good way like if you need if you don't know the feel yet you can kind of like look at the speed and be like, okay, like, we're going slow. We're going slower, th- or look around and be like, we're going slower than all the other boats. So you can see it that way, and it's good. So I guess, like, seeing it first and then feeling it. Um, but, yeah, like, you just, it's hard to explain, but once you look around and you see that you're going slower, then you know that something probably isn't right. Or if you see that you can't, if you hit a wave and you can't sail through it, um, that's a really good tell. And on the downwinds, if your skipper is having to head up, almost upwind to get you guys up on the step or like that kind of thing, like there, so there are tells um, and a lot of it is just looking around at the other boats. And if you can go out and practice, like practice with more than one boat, and you can set up the two boats completely differently and see which one's doing better. And it's a lot of just trial and error. Like, this worked, and then you write it down, and you're like, in this wind, in this condition, like, this is what felt really good. And then you, like, write down what doesn't work, and you're like, in this wind, in this condition, having the bang off was horrible, <laughs> or that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, just, like, being able to go out with other boats and play around with it, like, that way. Um, is a really good way and then once you can see that you're going fast just like close your eyes and feel what the boat feels like and that will help you get the feel so you can instead of having to look at other boats you know like I am going as fast as I can at this point or there's something wrong is that kind of yeah that's that? really cool uh, also knowing what your control what your options are Right. You, you have a set of things that you know, okay, I can try moving the jib cards, or I could ease the sheet, I could pull in the sheet, I could adjust the vang. So knowing what are the tools that I have available to me to shape the sail 
uh, plus body weight, right? Yeah. Am I hiking enough, right? Maybe we're not driving through because I'm not putting enough uh, work into it. So knowing your options sounds like it's also really Yes, critical. exactly. And a lot of that comes to, like, when you rig up the boat. Like, if I step on a new boat, like, this weekend I was on a Melges 15 for the first time. I wanted to rig the boat. I had no idea how to rig the boat, so I did need help. But, like, I wanted to rig the boat as much by myself as possible because then I knew every single line that was on the boat. I knew where the main sheet was. I knew if the bridle was adjustable. I knew that there was a boom vang and, and, out, and like how the outhaul worked and how the Cunningham worked. And on our jib, there's a leech line and a foot line. So I knew that those two were options. And I knew in this boat, there's, there's no windward sheet because there's like, you can move the car positions. Whereas like on a 29er, they have like the, um, like you move the sheet up and down the foot of the sail. And then you can also move like the sides in and out. Or on the 420, you don't have any of that and you just have your leeward sheet and your windward sheet. So every boat has different options. So it's really good to know what options are available in your boat. That's a great point. Get to know the boat that you're sailing in. It may be different from the boats you're used to. Yeah. Maybe different options. Yeah. Oh, so talk about the shoot. Um, you, you were sharing some great uh, insights with my crew. We were going through some moderate breeze with uh, uh, changes in pressure as you're, as you're going along, and you were helping him to understand how to adjust his, the chute for the different winds. Can you kind of walk through the, the challenge, the problem that he presented to you, and then what you suggested? Yeah, of course. So um, how I remember it is he was having trouble, um, like, as, like, going through the transition zones, the kite started to collapse. And he would have to, like, bring it back. But when the kite collapses, it takes an extra second to fill. So um, there was that, like, how do, I, how do I anticipate what's going to happen so my kite doesn't end up collapsing? So it's a lot of being proactive instead of reactive. And a lot of it comes with experience. Um, if you're sailing on an asymmetrical kite boat, if you can get yourself out on a 29er, it is a great option because if you're if you do something wrong, typically speaking, you end up in the water, um, which is a great learning tool, right? You're like, oh yeah, that was wrong. I'm now my boat's flipped over, um, but it really comes down to where your apparent wind is. Like, it's great to know where your true wind is and where the puffs are coming from and where the lulls are coming from, but on the downwinds in these boats, you're really trimming it to your apparent wind. Um, and as the wind conditions change or as you drive and as your speed accelerates, that is changing constantly. So when you sail into a lull, it's going to move back. And as you hit a puff, it's gonna come forward and when you get on the step, it's gonna go even more forward. So a lot of it comes down to like, skipper crew communication if the skipper has the ability to be looking out of the boat and calling what's about to hit that is great but a lot of the time you can actually feel it in the kite before it's going to hit um just because the kite is so thin it's so sensitive that you can be like oh there's a there's a puff coming I can feel the pressure building so I'm going to trim in a bit assuming that my apparent wind is going to come forward I'm not talking about strap the kite do not strap the kite because that is slow too but um, just that little bit in more and like you just to try and get like, OK, like I think this is where it needs to be. And then once the pressure fills, readjust and be like, is this right? Can I ease at all um, or should I pull in even more? And every boat's a little bit different, but just kind of figuring out what is going to happen to your apparent wind in this change. It, are you sailing into a lull? Is it going to go back? Should I ease? in it like not so much that it collapses but ease in anticipation so that as we sail through the lull we can keep that pressure in the kite and it doesn't end up strapped and as you come into a puff can I sheet in not necessarily early but as the puff is hitting us and then that will prevent the curl from becoming too much or the kite from collapsing completely and I'm still not perfect at it there were definitely a couple times this weekend where my kite was overstrapped or like it was collapsed and I got busy like looking out of the boat and 
I wasn't watching the kite, and my parent went shifted, and I didn't notice. So no one, no one is perfect at it, but it's the big thing, and the one that um, your crew that really clicked is I was like, you trim to the apparent wind. Figure out what your apparent wind is going to do, and f like see if you can be proactive in that reaction. Well, I always say that uh, sailing, the one who wins in sailing is the one who makes the fewest mistakes. You know, it's one of those things, nobody is perfect. Exactly, nobody yeah. Nobody knows exactly <laughs> what's going to happen with the wind. Uh, so certainly we're all making mistakes out there. And the other thing I would say is that, that the things that you've mentioned also matter for the driver. You know, so easing your main, tightening your main. Yes, and, exactly. And how you have your weight situated on the boat. If you know pressure is coming, being ready to move your weight to, so that you're, hopefully your boat never changes, right? Because you drive all that into forward motion. Uh, so anticipating, that's a great uh, yeah. a great point to make. And a lot of it, too, on these boats and really any boat where, like, you don't take your jib down, a lot of people forget about their jib on the downwinds. But if your jib is up, if it's not furled, if it's not, like, dropped on the deck, it is another sail and it will affect the flow that goes around your sails. So um, on the Melges 15s, there's a window in the main, and that is the perfect spot to look and just make sure that the slot between like the spinnaker and the jib and the jib and the main are all the same and it's really easy on these boats to notice because if your main is too far out it will be backwinded instantly and if your jib is too far out your kite isn't going to work properly and you can feel it in your kite so quickly and if you have never held a kite before and if you have a kite in your hands and the jib is too far out I guarantee you will notice almost immediately because it just there, like it doesn't feel right and if you pull that jib in a little bit more and get that slot opened up all of a sudden you're so much faster so like there are videos of us from this weekend and every once in a while we like get up on the step and I'm like hmm like something doesn't quite feel right so like I ended up like I was holding the kite sheet in one hand and I had my jib sheet in the other and I was just like do I need to ease it do I need to pull it in and I was kind of playing with that too because like as your apparent wind changes your jib trim also changes and it's one more thing to think about, and when you're starting out, don't worry about it. Just, like, find a, a kind of middle spot and just cleat it. But, like, as you get better and you're like, okay, like, I have my kite trim down pat, but, like, we still aren't going as fast. Start, like, look at that slot and figure that one out, too. That's a big part of it. Well, those are some great ideas, Abby. Thank you so much for sitting down with salesing.com, <laughs> and we'll hope to interview you again in the future. Of course, I would love to. Thank you so Thank much. You,